Hi friends, welcome to the Wild Side. I'm Steve Hall. Despite the absolute fear and hatred some people have for venomous snakes, there's still a bit of fascination with them. We even debated as to whether or not anyone would care about the quality of life of timber rattlers in Tennessee. But after learning more about research taking place on Chestnut Mountain, we were all in. This timber rattlesnake is thinking outside the box. A rattlesnake will escape. They want to get away. Given the opportunity, a rattlesnake will escape. And it would obviously be unwise to get in its way. It can be dangerous. You, you know, you don't want to be bit by a venomous creature. And from the perspective of a venomous snake expert, this rattler would probably prefer not to waste its poison on people. Venom is a very costly uh, commodity for the snake. It's what they use to capture prey. And it's a protein. So they must feed, they must have the opportunity to feed on enough protein to manufacture that venom. And they, that venom is not designed for us. That venom's not designed for protection. Will they use it for protection? Absolutely, if it's the last chance that they have to get away. Finding ways to keep people and snakes apart for their mutual benefit is a primary reason for a research project in the Bridgestone Nature Reserve at Chestnut Mountain. The reserve is owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. So we're here today to release one of our rattlesnakes that has a transmitter inserted into it that we are planning to track and follow that snake to understand better its life history requirements. So what I mean by life history, where is it breeding? Where is it feeding? Where is it going in for hibernation during the winter time? The expedition up the mountain teams Trisha Johnson of the Nature Conservancy with Dr. Danny Bryan from Cumberland University. He has studied venomous snakes for more than three decades. It's just a species I'm passionate about and want to protect. They're joined by John Hewlett, a commercial jet pilot turned biologist and snake disease expert at Murray State University. The reason I am here is uh, my research uh, traditionally has been kind of at the intersection of ecology and physiology. And one thing that I'm very interested in are how stress affects wildlife populations and the emergence of wildlife disease. So I've worked with Danny in the past for, for, for several years now, looking at snake fungal disease and timber rattlesnakes. I had a similar uh, project that I worked on in Western Kentucky that uh, he was an advisor for. The orange bucket has a rattlesnake in it. It's the last of five snakes captured so far as part of the study. The one that's going out today, we actually gave him a name that helps us with tracking our data. So his name is Huck. Because I caught him under blueberry bushes, so Huckleberry, I named him Huck. He was captured at the site that we're going to today, and so we're going to be releasing him back at the same site that, that we captured him. This research should help in planning management of the property for the future. Visitors so far have been by invitation only, primarily for research, education, and community events. We hope that we can do more of that and also have greater access to in other ways for the public. And so the rattlesnakes are one of the species on our property that we really want to protect because they are declining in their range and we have the mission to protect biodiversity and life on Earth. And so our research project to better understand their life history and where they're using our site can help us understand when we do public access, how we do public access and protect the snake from people and protect people from the snakes. The tracking devices will hopefully help with the design and placement of trails, and that can help make it less likely for people and rattlesnakes to unexpectedly cross paths. But the continuing decline in population of timber rattlesnakes is a serious concern to these scientists. Loss of habitat is one possible cause. Snake fungal disease, SFD, may also deserve some of the blame. It's the animal version of an epidemic, okay? It's an, um, it should say it's epizootic. So it's probably an endemic disease in the population, but we do feel, based on observations, that it is getting worse in snake populations currently. The fungus lives in the soil, 
and seems to thrive in damp and cool conditions. I think the evidence is starting to amass that it is probably driven in large part by climate change. But one thing that I'm interested in is stress hormones. So I, I study endocrinology in these animals and, and we do wonder how much human stress on the environment may play a role in increasing uh, the prevalence of SFD. There's no known cure for the disease. It can rarely be fatal in itself, but the illness weakens the snakes to a point of vulnerability against predators and to starvation because they no longer have the strength to forage for food. I, I don't think the babies are born yet. Um, I think she's still holding on to them. So there was a feeling of trepidation when the team was unable to find a pregnant female that was released several weeks ago. You know what, this may not be a good sign. I'm not getting any beep on her at all. I'm wondering if she come out and a hawk got her. But Dr. Bryan doesn't give up easily. He and John kept looking around the mountain until a beeping sound gave them a sigh of relief. There's not much room uh, where that snake could go because of the, uh, the steep bluff there. So I went into the woodland there perpendicular to the bluff and was able to get a signal. And we were able to uh, uh, track this female uh, back. She was using uh, mountain laurel as secondary cover to protect her from hawks. She has shed, she has had her babies, and now she's out uh, trying to forage and gain a meal before she goes into hibernation. So everything was good. A dead rattlesnake may seem like a good thing to a lot of people, but consider the role in the food chain as a natural firewall against carriers of diseases that are a greater threat to humans than the unlikely possibility of being bitten by a rattlesnake. Well, the snakes keep the rodent populations under control. And something else about these snakes, they also help keep tick populations under control. One rattlesnake can potentially take out 5,000 ticks per year on the rodents that they eat. Now let's just pretend half of those ticks are females. So we got 2,500 female ticks. One female tick has the potential laying 60,000 eggs in a year, in that season. Now, do the math. How many ticks is a snake controlling? So they are very important in many ways to ecosystems. By dining on rodents, the snakes also help protect the food chain for other animals. For instance, there's an oak tree right here, and there are acorns on that on this oak tree, this white oak tree, and White-tailed deer and turkey are dependent upon some of these acorns. Um, but squirrels and, and rodents like these acorns too, and they will capture these acorns and put them in places where the deer and the turkeys do not have access. So you're looking at like one squirrel has a potential of uh, stashing away 10,000 acorns in a year. We're starting to limit what's available to deer and turkey by increasing the number of rodents. So releasing Huck back into the wild goes much further than just trying to save the future of rattlesnakes. We're trying to learn all we can about the conservation value and the place that Chestnut Mountain is. And so any of our rare animals or plants or even declining animals and plants, we want to make sure that we put them first. And so when we're thinking about access to the property, bringing folks out to enjoy the place that we have, we want to make sure we're protecting that conservation value in these animal and plants that are, that are our mission in, in providing that protection. Dr. Bryan spends a lot of time dispelling what he describes as myths about rattlesnakes. First of all, he says they don't chase you, although he can't say the same thing about copperheads. And he says rattlesnakes are actually shy and reclusive and can only strike a distance of about one third of their bodies. Tennessee's wild side has been a presentation of the Jackson Foundation in association with Rockwater TV.